glory which we sing. God's grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May his love be upon your heart, now and forevermore. Amen. There's an old article from 2014 whose headline reads, This isn't a pile of trash, it's a dog that's about to undergo a major transformation. On the streets of Canada, a little poodle shih tzu looked pretty bad. He looked kind of like the insides of a dusty abandoned building had completely covered him for years and years. The dog's hair was caked in a thick layer of dirt, all matted hair in clumps and curls that nearly doubled the dog's size. And you couldn't even see one of the dog's eyes. That's how bad it was. The dog was brought to a shelter, and six employees shaved off more than six pounds of hair. And after a few days of recovery and rehydration, it was completely new, a completely new and adorable little dog. That dog's matted hair made it look like trash. That is a comparable description to what God calls the Israelites in the book of Ezekiel. In our chapter today, they were covered in filth, except it wasn't layers of matted hair. It was blood, their stained blood, their guilt blood of their sins. Much like Abel's blood called out to God when he was murdered, the Israelites left a blood trail that left God smelling it for miles away. And they were terribly unclean. Now God had tried to clean them. In fact, the Hebrew word there is tahir. It is in the PL tense, the mood of PL. And that means that the word is intensified. That means God really tried. He tried and tried. He scrubbed and scrubbed at their stains, but the Israelites refused to be cleaned. So they ran away from their master as the master drew the bath. In fact, the Israelites loved their blood bath. They smeared it on a rock, the text says. Well, how do people get to that point? Because if we are dirty, you would think that we would want a bath to be washed clean. But somehow people do refuse to be cleansed. Well, to answer that question, we will look at a historical illustration from history. Well, before there was Benedict Arnold, who planned to betray his country in 1780, before there was a Benedict Arnold, there was... Thomas Hickey, who also betrayed his country. When George Washington first took command of the army in the Revolutionary War, he looked to hire men to protect him, to guard him in the March of 1776. And these men were to be great men, honest men, sober men, men of great character, brave. And Hickey just happened to be one of those hand-picked men among 79 others to be one of these elite men to protect Washington. And Hickey started out well, and he started out strong. He was even among Washington's favorites. But behind the scenes, Hickey had conspired against George Washington and the whole Continental Army. He joined a plot drummed up by the loyalist and governor of New York, William Tryon. And the plan was to kill Washington and to kill the key leaders and then set the city on fire, thus declaring victory for the British. Well, Hickey was caught because he was arrested for handling counterfeit money. And unable to keep his silence in jail, Hickey boasted of his exploits to a fellow prisoner, Isaac Ketchum. And Ketchum snitched on him in an effort to free himself. And so Hickey was found out. And Hickey was sentenced to death to be hanged. Hanged 
June 28th, 1776. And why did Hickey do it? For the money. Greed. He desired a more prestigious position as he once had when he worked for the British Army. Furthermore, he lost his fervor for the American cause. He was bored with George Washington, and he was bored with the other patriots. Now, after being caught, a prisoner might feel remorse and should feel remorse, but not Hickey. No, he held disdain and scorn against George Washington and the other patriots. On the day of his hanging, Hickey refused any prayers from the chaplain. Instead, he mocked the clergyman that was there. Then he sneered at his accusers and threatened and taunted them that they might die next. There was no remorse. There was no regret. There was no sorrow for his sins. He only wished that he wouldn't have been caught, that he would have succeeded in his plan to kill George Washington. Even in the face of death, Hickey didn't care that he was a filthy, dirty man. So how do we get to the point that we don't want to be washed clean? Well, just hug yourself and never let go. It is pride. It is greed. It is the self-serving ego within all of us. That's exactly what Hickey suffered from. That is exactly what the Israelites suffered from, too. Where we are full of pride and we say, I will justify myself even though it is not justifiable at all. Hickey, when he was on trial for his crimes, he justified himself saying that he was just looking for an escape just in case the British were too strong and attacked. And that he was attracted to the money. Those were just only half-truths because deep down he was determined to go through the act to kill Washington. But is it a surprise that he got there? And is it a surprise that you and I are the same because deep down we all suffer from the same sin disease. We act to satisfy ourselves and we justify it saying that it will be beneficial to us. None are excluded. As Psalm 14, 2 through 3 writes, all have turned aside. There is none that who is good, not even one. Or Isaiah writes in Isaiah chapter 64, all of us, that is all, all of us have become like one who is unclean. And so with this sin disease and our self-serving nature, we say, it's all about me. I'm looking out for myself, and it feels good. That's our condition. We are born with it. But there's another analogy that we can draw from Hickey. Hickey was done with Washington. He was done with all of the other colonies and the colonists. He disassociated himself from them, and he joined another club, the club of the enemy. And Hickey didn't think much of Washington or the colonists. He looked down on them. And, and in a similar way, when we are living in our sin, when we are being selfish and self-serving, we say to God, God, I am done with you. And I am done with those who are associated with you. I will not be part of that club. And we do think of it as a club in our sins. In our sinful nature, we think of God and the church as a club, even though it is not. It is not a club. No, God is a family. God is the eternal family that we were created to be part of. And so when we leave God and his church in our selfish sins, we are leaving family, leaving the eternal family, the family of God. And in our sins, we think our rebellion is just fine, just a free choice of ours to please ourselves, that there's nothing wrong 
pleasing ourselves, satisfying ourselves, because we are free, free to leave the family if we so wish. What do you care, Father? And in satisfying ourselves, we do and might say, God, I'm done with you. You go ahead and die. And those associated with God, you go ahead and die too. I don't need you. You are worthless. You know what that makes us? That makes us dirty. That makes us filthy to the core. Makes us very unclean. So that is our sin problem. That is how we become unclean to the point that we might tell ourselves, we don't want to be cleansed. We don't want to be clean. We don't want to take a bath. But is that where God leaves us? No. No way. God doesn't want us to be eternally dirty in our blood guilt. As God said, I would have cleansed you in Ezekiel 24, 13. And he tries to cleanse us. Or in Ezekiel 18, In Ezekiel 33, God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather prefers and is pleased when they turn and that they would live. God has cared for us as if we were his own precious children, as if we were his own adoring and delightful wife. So what is God's plan to clean us? Well, our text implies that God has been working to clean us for a long time. Since when? Since Adam and Eve gave us the sin-stained disease in the first place. He gave us instruction and warning about our sins, as he did to Cain. God gave us hope and a way of deliverance, promising a Savior and choosing Abraham. God went after his chosen children, delivering them from the slavery of Egypt and giving them a way of life through the Ten Commandments, as well as establishing a sacrificial system that atoned for their sins. And God continued to pursue them and warn them and instruct them and to offer more deliverance by sending prophets, prophets like Ezekiel. And then Jesus came. Jesus came and he had more to say about how he wanted to clean us all. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, even though you were not willing. And Jesus said he came to save the lost sinners of the world, to bring them to repentance. And he said that he seeks us when we are wandering off. And he said that there is a new beginning and a new birth in him. He offered the forgiveness of sin, saying, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. And then Jesus suffered, and he was whipped and beaten and crucified. And here is the important part. He bled. He shed a lot of blood. The blood of Jesus, the lamb, is the cleansing agent. We are filthy and stained in blood guilt, and so Jesus cleans us up with his perfect blood. That makes us a completely new person, as if six pounds of hair were shaved off of us. His blood makes us bright. His blood makes us clear. His blood sets us right. Hebrews 9 writes of Jesus' blood, saying, He went through a great and more perfect tabernacle. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. This blood cleanses us from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set us free. And how is this cleansing agent applied? Well, through word and sacrament. As 1 John 1 writes, if we walk in the light, 
as he is the light, that is Jesus. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all our sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, though, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not found in us. King David gives a good example of this in his psalm, Psalm 51, praying, Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. It is Jesus. Jesus is connected to us in his word, and his light shines in us to dispel the darkness. We confess our sins, and he forgives us. He makes us clean. We do it every Sunday. We do it every day. Confess our sins and be clean. And so in this way, Jesus makes us clean. But there is more, though. When Jesus had his last supper of Passover, he said, All of you, drink of it, for this is my blood. In the new covenant, which is being poured out for many, for the atonement, for the forgiveness of sins. In the Lord's Supper, we are connected to Jesus. When we partake of the Supper today, drink and eat, that is a cleansing act that cleans us. And all of this cleansing, all of this cleaning, will one day have its fulfillment. As Revelation chapter 7 writes, The chosen believers will have their robes washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. For he purchased his own people with his own blood. That is how God has cleansed us and continues to cleanse us. That taher word in the Hebrew, taher in the P.L., it intensifies Be clean. God intensely cleans us up. He scrubs away at us with the blood of Jesus so that we will become clean. And those who are connected to Jesus, they are cleansed. And those who continue to refuse his cleansing agent, they stand condemned. Kind of like Thomas Hickey. But how great it is. How great it is that God comes to us, and he claims us, and he bought us, and cleanses us, all with his precious blood. In 2010, in 2010, there was a man in China who went for a swim at night in what he thought was a river. Well, the river that he went into wasn't actually a river. The man found himself stuck in a heap of mud, in some silt, and he was really stuck, really, really stuck in the mud. Up to his waist, up to his arms, he couldn't get out. Well, the man had his cell phone on him, but he was too embarrassed, too embarrassed to call for help, and so didn't call for help for four hours. And he asked two fishermen passing by for some help. He then took the emergency service, uh, the services to get him out another seven hours to actually free him up. And what was more difficult is the man could have more easily been saved if he would have just got out of his clothes and kind of just gone in his underwear. But the man didn't want to do that because he was too embarrassed. He wanted didn't want to strip down to just his underwear. And so what the rescuers did is they stripped down to their underwear too to make him feel better about it, that it was less embarrassing. The lesson to be learned for us, don't be too embarrassed about our filth. When you are stuck in the mud, confess it. And don't refuse, like Thomas Hickey, don't refuse God to come to you so that he can cleanse you. Rather, let God come to you. Let God come to you and 
come to you as you are, naked, filthy, messed up in that sin disease. Let God apply his healing agent, the blood of the lamb. God will take what looks like trash and make you into something much more beautiful again. A person who is whole and stands in God's family, who stands in the house of God. You belong to God. You are his. And what is our response? Well, we don't say God and his church are contemptible maggots. Kill them. I would much rather please myself. No, rather we will praise God's name and be loyal to him and obey the best we can. We will worship our God and we will love our neighbor and we will act as the clean people that God has created us to be. And may we ever pray as David prayed, God cleanse me and I will be clean, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep and guard us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's rise and sing our offertory as printed before us. <laughs>